This week on the agenda, Donald Trump is heading back to the White House. But what will his second term really mean for the rest of the world? The votes have been counted and Donald Trump has been returned to the White House for a second term. Voters in the US said the key issue for them was the economy and whether they felt better off after four years of President Biden. But what does Trump's re-election mean for the rest of the world? For relations with China, the EU and the rising global south and for the conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East? Joining me now are Huawei Lu, Senior Advisor on China at the Carter Center and an adjunct professor of political science at Emory University. Professor Henrik Stalhen Him from the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. And Michael O'Hanlon, Senior Fellow and Director of Research for Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on the agenda. Michael, let, let's start with you and, and, and let's start with a a wide angle lens. How do you see Trump's second term affecting American foreign policy? Greetings. Well, it certainly is big news, mm. and uh, I'm surprised by the margin of victory. In regard to foreign policy, I think the big question for me will be does Trump govern in a second term, sort of like he did in the first term, by reaching into the community of strong, accomplished, experienced, American foreign policy practitioners, but putting putting his own twist on it, or does he go much more in a disruptive, radical direction, tapping into his inner circle, fellow, quote unquote, disruptors or mavericks? In other words, if he chooses people like Jim Mattis and Rex Tillerson and Mike Pompeo to run defense and state, that signals one kind of presidency where he perhaps is trying to make foreign policy a relatively quiet area of his presidency and try to do his so-called peace through strength strategy, echoing Ronald Reagan, and in some ways building on his first term? Or does he go and try to change things radically, perhaps uh, reconsidering certain alliances? And some of the ones he's talked about, of course, have included South Korea or Germany or NATO in general. So is Trump going to be sort of like Trump 1.0, or is Trump 2.0 going to be much more disruptive? That's the big question, and I don't know how to answer it yet. Henrik, I wonder, as a European, if, if you know whether how to answer that question yet. I also don't know how to answer that question yet. But as a European, there are uh, several areas that are of potential concern that will definitely be watched uh, in, in Europe. Uh, the first would be prospects uh, for uh, greater protectionism um, under a Trump administration and uh, tariffs being levied on goods imported uh, from Europe. Uh, I think. The EU is better prepared now uh, than it was back in 2016, but that it's still an area of concern. Uh, another area would be uh, the degree of support to Ukraine. Uh, and the third area of major concern would be uh, Trump's policy towards uh, NATO, which was, uh, I mean, uh, a big issue uh, mm. during his, his previous uh, uh, presidency. And Yahweh, what about you for, from the Chinese perspective? Well, from the Chinese perspective, I think uh, it uh, partially answers the question that Michael said he cannot answer. That is, uh, President Trump probably will value loyalty more than expertise. If you look at, you know, toward the last few days of the election, you know, the people who worked with him, particularly the generals and the defense uh, secretary, all started criticizing him, and he and his team are probably going to be very careful, you know, not to choose expertise over, uh, you know, loyalty. And also with the Senate controlled by the Republican, so it's a lot easier for him to confirm who he wants. Uh, you know, Henry said uh, Europe is better prepared. I think China, uh, from my uh, communication with China scholars, uh, they have long ago uh, Bet that Trump is going to return to the White House, so they are uh, probably even better prepared. But you know, Trump, as unpredictable and uncertain as he is, uh, so the China side still is holding its breath and to see who are the people that will be uh, members of his national security team mm. and what uh, Trump will do toward Taiwan. Michael, I, I want to talk to you about Ukraine because during the campaign. 
Donald Trump promised to end the conflict in Ukraine in a day. And um, he also said he's going to bring peace to the Middle East. I mean, can he really do that? I mean, what, what, what does it all mean? Well, of course, he can't do that. And I'm not even sure if he believes he can do that. But what I think he's signaling is that the exact final ceasefire line in Ukraine doesn't matter that much to him or to the United States or to NATO, for that matter. In other words, as long as Russia is essentially stopped from its maximalist ambitions in Ukraine and Ukraine survives as a country, we're OK. And the most important thing is to stop the fighting as soon as possible so as to reduce the risks of a future confrontation between Russia and the West and also for the good of the people in a war where more than a million casualties have already been suffered. So that instinct, as far as it goes, in my mind, is unobjectionable. The question is, how do you actually get the Ukrainians and the Russians to agree on that? And then what kind of mechanism do you have to ensure that Ukraine is never attacked again in the future? And that's where I don't think Trump has a strategy. I mean, we saw in his first term, he had these big ideas for negotiating with Kim Jong-un in North Korea, for example, and he had three summits. And I supported that because I thought America had been too reluctant to engage with North Korea. And maybe Trump could do something useful. But after three summits, he had sort of run out of ideas and run out of gas. And we all know that the US-DPRK relationship didn't really change, ultimately, under Trump's presidency. So I suspect he's going to have to do a lot of hard work to figure out how to create incentives for both President Zelensky and President Putin to accept, essentially, the current front line as the armistice line and then to figure out some kind of mechanism to help Ukraine over the longer term. Uh, I, I don't know that Trump wants to bring Ukraine into NATO, but is there something better than just a paper agreement like the you know, Minsk uh, agreements or the Budapest Memorandum of 94 that ultimately did not do very well at protecting Ukraine? So those are the big questions. And I don't think Trump has answered them yet. I, he's got an instinct that this war should end and that the current front line is an acceptable armistice line. But that's probably as far as he's gotten in his thinking. And Henrik, um, on, on the Middle East, do you think that, that Trump is going to do what he said he wanted to do? No, I doubt, I mean, uh, that he will be able to secure uh, any sort of peace agreement uh, in the Middle East and bring an end to, to fighting there too. I think, I mean, uh, uh, also under uh, the Biden administration, we've seen very clearly that, I mean, Israel is kind of doing uh, as it wants. Uh, so, so I doubt it also uh, in terms of the Middle East. Yahweh, um, China has vowed to work with the United States on the basis of mutual respect and peaceful coexistence. How do you see that playing out under President Trump? So from the Chinese leader's perspective, there are three pillars to the bilateral relationship. You know, you mentioned two, uh, mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and then there is the third cliche, a win-win cooperation. You know, it's hard uh, to operationalize mutual respect because uh, Trump and his team has their way of, you know, defining what is respect, and, and China has its own way of defending respect. But uh, peaceful coexistence, I think that's understood by both sides. So the big challenge is for uh, both sides to realize, you know, the guardrails uh, that the Biden administration has worked so hard, you know, to erect, you know, will they still be there or, you know, they're going to be wobbling or they're going to uh, be totally uh, pulled off. And then finally, I think the bigger change for both sides is, you know, in order to peacefully coexist, we have to find areas where there is uh, cooperation or uh, even coordination. Uh, so given you know, what happened in the first four years of his administration, it may be hard, but uh, I think we all need to be uh, brave and imaginative uh, in coming up with areas where the two countries can really cooperate. So let's talk a little bit more about that. I mean, Henrik, when, when President Xi congratulated um, President Trump, he, he said that China and the U.S. should focus on that collaboration rather than confrontation. I mean, is that how you see things working out with China? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I think uh, the strong rivalry that we've seen emerge between the United States and, and, and China is basically here to stay. Um, and it's also one of the relatively few areas of uh, bipartisan agreement, at least by and large, between the two major parties uh, in the United States. 
Um, I mean, um, the changes between the Trump administration, the first Trump administration, and the Biden administration in terms of its policies towards China were, at least from my perspective, surprisingly uh, small in many ways. Uh, many of the uh, more controversial uh, policies on trade, for instance, were largely kept intact uh, during the Biden administration. And I think, I mean, the rivalry uh, between the United States and China is sort of structurally driven. It's driven by a tremendous shift uh, in uh, global power and influence, um, with China emerging really uh, as a pole in a bipolar uh, international uh, system. Uh, so I think it's a long-term uh, rivalry, how intense it might become. Maybe, you know, uh, uh, there's some, some room for debate there. But uh, in terms of the long-term prospects, uh, I think uh, we'll see uh, more of that rivalry uh, during the uh, during the uh, next Trump administration. Michael, let's talk about the the U.S. relationship with, with Europe. Those two major um, Western powers. You know, wh where do you think the potential bumps in the road might be in a second Trump administration? Well, I think Henrik laid it out well: uh, trade and protectionism. Russia and the Ukraine war, and then the nature of the NATO alliance. Those would be the three big bins. I would also add a different way of looking at the question, which would be to build on what I said at the beginning of the show and to say, is Trump going to be like he was the first time? In which mm -hmm. case, things will be often unpleasant, often contentious, often, you know, characterized by dispute and acrimony, but ultimately we'll get by. We won't pull U.S. forces out of major positions in Europe. We won't tear up the entire international economic order. You know, there'll be certain sectors of the economy where we do more protectionism or more subsidization, but on balance, we'll get through it. Nobody will enjoy it, but it'll be okay. That's Trump 1.0. Trump 2.0 could threaten to pull U.S. troops out of Europe or actually say that Article 5 is no longer binding on the United States, or at least that it will interpret Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, the Mutual Defense clause in such a way that we don't even use military force to defend our allies unless they're up to a certain percent of spending and say that consistently enough that people start to believe it, including perhaps even the Russians. And so you could imagine a much more disruptive kind of Trump and, you know, in the worst case, an end to the NATO alliance on, on his watch. So those are the two kinds of perspectives I would add to the mix, uh, not just the issue by issue and analysis, but also are we in for Trump 1.0, you know, a repeat mm. of that, or is Trump 2.0 going to be a much more disruptive kind of American foreign policy and the jury is still out? Well, let's pause there for a moment, gentlemen, but do stay with us. As still to come here on the agenda, drill, baby, drill. What does the Trump victory mean for the global green transition? We are all connected across borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to the agenda. Let's continue now with our analysis of Donald Trump's return to power in the United States and what it means for the rest of the world. Still with me are Yahweh Liu, senior advisor on China at the Carter Center and an adjunct professor of political science at Emory University. Professor Henrik Stalhain Him from the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies and Michael O'Hanlon, 
Senior Fellow and Director of Research at the Foreign Policy Programme at the Brookings Institution. Yahweh, let's talk trade. Trump's line was uh, America first, and you know he's promised tariffs on every single European good entering the United States. 60% on everything from China, right into 100% on Chinese electric vehicles. I mean, do you see him actually doing that now that he's won? I mean, does he really have the power to do that? Well, uh, Trump is one of the maybe the first uh, president, you know, who uh, during the campaign said one thing and then after the election, he went out and did what he pledged during the campaign. So he probably is deadly serious on what he was going to do. You know, he was the first to weaponize uh, tariff. He started uh, the trade war with China. Surprisingly, as was mentioned by the other two speakers, you know, uh, President Biden never touched uh, the tariff. Uh, so, you know, he probably will come through uh, in terms of imposing more uh, tariff uh, on uh, Chinese goods. You know, he has this uh, conviction that uh, tariff, maybe he thinks tariff can uh, substitute uh, tax uh, so that, you know, the tariff uh, can be used to support, you know, U.S. defense and Social Security and all the other things. So he is deadly serious in terms of it. Uh, but uh, whether he has power, well, he has more power uh, than he uh, did uh, when he was the president uh, four years ago. Uh, so the whole world uh, should hold its breath and be prepared uh, for a very uh, drastic and, and possibly traumatic uh, trade war in the world. I mean, and in which sectors are we talking about? Are we looking at steel? Are we looking at aluminium? I mean, where do you see the, the, the rifts worsening now? Huawei. Well, the risks are in, you know, how this is going to impact the uh, global economy, which is still uh, in a very weak uh, stage, uh, how this is going to impact the uh, Chinese economy. Uh, many experts have said, you know, what Trump is going to do will ha impact the uh, Chinese economy in such a way that 2% uh, of the GDP will be shared off. You know, when China economy gets down, uh, and it really has uh, very political ramifications, and uh, I think EU is is maybe happy uh, on the tariff on, on uh, EVs. It's already one hundred percent tariff on Chinese EVs, even though they're not sold here. Not many. I mean, less than five hundred were sold last year. But EU. Maybe welcome that, but the EU will face its own risk uh, of you know all its merchandise going to China will be taxed. Michael, I want to talk about energy because Trump's identified his energy policy as drill, baby, drill. You know he's a fossil fuel fan. He's talked about pulling out of the Paris uh, Climate Accord again. Um, what does his re-election mean, do you think, for the global green transition? Well, it's first important, I think, to keep perspective on the global green transition. And the perspective I would offer is that it's very slow. On the one hand, we are impressed by all the solar panels and windmills that are being produced and operationalized and become visible. But if you look at overall trends on this planet with 8 billion people, all of whom want to live a better life and many of whom are becoming more prosperous, we are still collectively pumping out more carbon dioxide each year than ever before in the history of the human race. So yes, we're becoming slightly more green, but it's in the single digit percentages. And meanwhile, even under President Biden, even with the Paris Accords in effect, we continue to use more hydrocarbons. So in that sense, I feel like there's more, there's more smoke than fire here. There's more political rhetoric. I don't think Trump's going to undo the subsidies for renewable energy. Maybe he will. but. That, that will that kind of technology will continue to progress, but it will be at a modest pace. Maybe Trump will renew nuclear energy. That would actually be a more interesting development in terms of the potential to make a big difference down the road. Uh, but I think that on balance, you're going to hear more of a change in rhetoric than in the actual structure of the energy economy in the United States or anywhere else in the world. Yeah, well, I wonder if you uh, agree with that because you know China, for example, is so committed to those net zero goals. Do you think that America will have an option or not to stand in line 
with the rest of the world? No, I, I think under Trump administration, uh, US-China cooperation, at least in the past four years, uh, climate is a, one area where there is some uh, meaningful cooperation. But then the US assault on China's so-called overcapacity uh, has almost terminated uh, you know, its meaningful collaboration with China. So I, th I think China is hugely committed uh, you know, to all the climate goals. Uh, but whether China can work with the U.S. or even with the EU, I, I think that's questionable. But China, as far as I can concern, uh, as far as I'm concerned, will stick to its uh, goal uh, of uh, climate uh, change. And, and so we, we can probably see separate tracks where China is going to go, where U.S. is going to go. Mm. And, and hopefully... You know, these questions can be resolved, you know, maybe at, uh, uh, you know, at United Nations, which may be an illusion. If I could add one quick note on that very briefly, yeah. I agree with the, with the professor's assessment, and I agree with the sincerity of China's policy. But it's also worth pointing out that China itself is also building more coal plants yes. all the time. China itself wants cheap energy, and, and that's not wrong. But we have to bear in mind the goals that people have set for the future are different from the current behavior. And that's true in the United States. That's true in China. That's true in most of the world. Henrik, let's um, shift the spotlight to emerging economy alliances. I'm thinking particularly of, of, of BRICS, who have grown substantially since Donald Trump was last in office, um, last in the White House. It's now this diverse set of emerging and middle powers. And I wonder if you expect the, the new... U.S. administration to engage more closely with them, or do you think that that gap, that gulf between the global north and the global south is only going to widen? I don't really expect um, very much engagement with, with BRICS as a, as a forum. Uh, I mean, uh, for one thing, you know, during a Republican uh, administration engagement with those types of multilateral institutions, mm -hmm. I think there will probably be some skepticism of it. And I mean, BRICS in many ways represents uh, a bit of a, a challenge or at least a potential counterweight to, to sort of traditional um, Western-led uh, institutions. So in that sense also, I, I wouldn't hold my breath in terms of, you know, a lot of engagement uh, from a, a future uh, uh, Trump administration and, and, and BRICS uh, as such. Um, I mean, BRICS is becoming a important uh, fora, but I think at the same time, it's important not to exaggerate uh, its meaning. It is it is an impressive organization or, or, or fora, but uh, I mean, its member states are uh, diverse. They have diverse interests. And in many ways, I think it's easier for, for the member states to agree on what they're uh, opposed to, uh, which is, you know, uh, or skeptical about at least some of the traditional Western-led, uh, at least as they've seen, um, international institutions. I think it's harder uh, for, for BRICS to find areas of agreements and, and to reach sort of common goals, such as uh, the ambitious goal of, of establishing some sort of uh, uh, alternative digital currency of its own. Um, I think there's also one other thing which is often overlooked when it comes to BRICS, and that is the huge power asymmetry that you have uh, within, mm. within that forum. Um, I mean, if you take the traditional or the old five BRICS members, uh, you know, China had an economy uh, or has an economy which is uh, twice the size of all the other BRICS members combined. If you had the new uh, BRICS members, China's economy is still, you know, um, they wouldn't be even two thirds of China's total economy. And that power asymmetry uh, creates a bit of a challenge in terms of, you know, um, reaching uh, common agreements and, you know, uh, concern also likely by some of the member states of, of, of China sort of dominating uh, that forum. OK, so you're, you're sceptical then about the, the power that they as a group could wield. But I wonder, Michael, how, how you see it. I mean, do you think that the United States maybe needs to pay closer attention to, to the rise and the glow, growing economic might of the global south, divided though it may be at times? Or do you think that Trump even recognises that? 
It's a great question. I think the answer is yes, we do need to pay more attention. But the BRICS are a funny concoction right now, and I agree with Heinrich. They're, they're more unified in what they oppose than in what they favor. But the Iran nuclear question is going to be a big issue, which could divide Europe and Trump. Mm. and certainly will preoccupy them both. And um, the notion of an organization that has, again, in my mind, forward-looking, progressive, rightly-minded countries, we may have disagreements, but you know, China, Brazil, South Africa, India, these, these are good countries that are trying to do good things in the world. But the BRICS now also include Russia, which is waging a war against its neighbor, and Iran. So I don't see how the BRICS develop a positive agenda with those two countries as among their core members. Which brings me on to, um, Henrik, then your, your hopes and fears for, for the next four years. You know, where do you think we'll be by 2028? Well, it's difficult to make predictions and in general, and especially with Trump, as we've touched upon, being a potentially very unpredictable um, president. But I think there are a few, few uh, predictions you, you could make. Uh, I don't know how positive they are. Um, but I think uh, great power rivalry and the rivalry between China and the United States is going to be uh, a dominant feature of international politics uh, for the foreseeable future and definitely also in, in 2028 uh, because it's structurally driven. I don't see that uh, going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I also think tensions between uh, Europe, uh, uh, European countries and Russia are going to remain uh, high. Uh, even if the Ukraine uh, war somehow ends, you know, the tensions between uh, Russia and uh, most other European countries uh, will uh, remain uh, strong. And I mean, because of those great power, uh, that great power rivalry, all of that could basically be put under the rubric of great power rivalry. Um, I think there are other uh, concerning uh, issues which you can foresee, one being the demise of arms control and uh, the total demise of arms control and uh, of nuclear buildup that we're seeing the contours of now um, and I, that I think, unfortunately, is uh, only likely to uh, intensify over the next uh, four years. So again, that's not a very positive assessment, no. but I think, unfortunately, <laughs> that's the world we're moving into. Yahweh, how about you? Are, are you as uh, downbeat as Henrik? Well, uh, I think, you know, from January the 20th next year to the end of his term, what I would like to see uh, happening, of course, is the end of the war in Ukraine and also peace in the Middle East. But what I really don't like to see is if these two conflicts are terminated under Trump, then U.S. is not going to uh, reassign all the resources to Asia uh, Indo-Pacific, so that you know the danger of, of war, which could be far worse uh, than Russo-Ukraine war or Israel-Hamas war, you know, with you know, a war between U.S. and China. So I, I hope and I think you know Michael mentioned about the personnel. You know, Elon Musk right now is uh, one of the closest advisors and could be uh, a cabinet member. You know, considering his tie with with China and also some of the Wall Street financiers that are advising Trump. So I'm, I'm hopeful that rationality will prevail uh, in managing a great power rivalry, in managing bilateral relationship. And I, that's what I hope to see. If that is not managed well, then we're heading uh, toward a, a, a world of darkness. Michael O'Hanlon, Henrik Stelhin, him and Xiaowei Lu, thank you all very much. Thank you. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out At The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming up on a future agenda. As world leaders head to Peru for the annual APEC summit, we'll be asking what such gatherings mean for the rise of the Global South. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the Agenda team here in London, goodbye.